The following is a production of the Fairfax Network. Fairfax County Public Schools. Funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. Hello and welcome to the MTA studio, home of Meet the Author. My name is Della Kidd. If you think you can just read Mad Magazine as a kid, grow up to work in an automotive factory for 13 years, raise a family, hold every job from maintenance man to political campaigner, and still produce award-winning books for children, you're right. But as my guest, Christopher Paul Curtis, might suggest, there's a catch. Before there were any prizes for the Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963, Bud Not Buddy, and Bucking the Sarge, author Christopher Paul Curtis created goals for himself. Write every day, attend classes, and publish stories kids will read and really like. Christopher Paul Curtis, welcome back to MTA. Thank you, Della. It's a pleasure to be back. It's a pleasure to have you. And it looks like you met a lot of those goals and more. I've tried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On your last visit to our studio, you were told us that you were just finishing Bucking the Sarge. Um, how is the character Luther T. Farrell the same or different from Bud in Bud Not Buddy um, or Kenny in The Watsons Go to Birmingham? He's different in that uh, there's a big age difference. Uh, mm -hmm. Luther is 15, Kenny and Bud were both 10. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, an older narrator gives me a lot more freedom, I think. I think that I can uh, tell use language that I couldn't use as uh, for younger readers. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean in the sense of swear words. Right. I mean just the, the level of maturity. The level, right, right, the level of intelligence right. is hopefully a lot higher Absolutely. at 15. Yeah. Uh, so it's, I think it's different in that way. Um, I think they're similar characters in that uh, they all kind of look at the world through mm -hmm. the eyes of their creator, through my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I look at things in a humorous slant. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's similarities in that way. And of course their home lives are very different. Their home lives are very yes. different, yeah. And they all, uh, I don't know, it seems to be the theme that's running throughout my writing is there's a family, the search for family. Um, the Watsons had a family, Bud was searching for a family, and Luther is kind of the other end of the spectrum. He's in a family uh, that is not quite functional and he's looking for something that's a little more stable. You do this very well. You make characters that people care about. How do you do it? it it's not a conscious effort. I think what, uh, what I try to do is, I, first of all, I have fun with my writing. I tell stories in the way that I would like to read something. Uh, it's a slow process. It's a process of getting to know the character. Uh, when I first start to write, I, mm -hmm. it's, it's very hit and miss. The character hasn't come to me quickly. And this was particularly true of Luther in Bucking the mm -hmm. Sarge. Took him a long time before he would cooperate and talk to me every day. Had to become real in your own head. Right, they yeah. have to become real. Right. And, and you, it's like taking dictation, that old sure. cliche. Uh, so once you get the character, then, then you can have fun with it. That's when the writing becomes fun. I, I mm -hmm. never know what they're going to say, what they're going to do. And the fun part is molding what they say into the form of a story. You've referred to some of your characters as composites. What is a composite, and could you explain that a little bit for us? Okay, as a composite, when I say a character is a composite, uh, a lot of times people will say to me, who are you in the mm -hmm. Watsons? Are you Kenny, or are you mm -hmm. Bud, or are, are you uh, Byron? And uh, I'm really both of them, and I'm neither of them. Uh, by, as a composite, I could take some of your characteristics mm -hmm. Uh, my characteristics, combine them, and make one character out of them. And the only thing that you, I as a writer have to do is make sure that that character remains consistent throughout mm -hmm. the story. So uh, as a composite, it's just a combination of different people. I, I don't think I've ever written a character who was based on any one person. Let's go to a few emails. These are from students who have read The Watsons Go to Birmingham. And the first reads, Dear Mr. Curtis, in The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963, you write about a church bombing. It made me feel sad. Do you remember this real event on September 15, 1963? What was your reaction at the time? And this is uh, written sincerely, Pooja. Pooja, I do remember. I was 10 years old at the time, same age as Kenny. 
And the reason I have such a distinctly clear memory of what happened, uh, my parents, I, you know, my kids say that we were strict with them. My parents were much stricter. We used to go to bed about 6.30, and uh, the news would come on at 6.30, and my older sister and I would sneak up and sit behind the couch and watch the news with my parents uh, without them knowing. And I can remember when this bombing took place, seeing it on the news, and both my parents were very uh, disturbed and cried. And it was something that really stuck in my mind because of that. Um, as a 10-year-old, I didn't really understand what was going on. My parents explained it to me, but I didn't understand it. It wasn't until I was much older that I really realized the full impact of what it was. And even now that I'm older, now I can understand it in the terms of terrorism and how it was terroristic acts that were uh, per perpetrated on the people of Birmingham. Thank you for that uh, question, Pooja. Um, I'm sure you had to incorporate a lot of research into it, even though you were alive during the time and you remember your parents reflecting on it, there was a certain level of research you had to do to incorporate that into your book as well. Oh yeah, you have to, uh, to make the story seem mm -hmm. real, uh, to ground it in fact, there, there does have to be a lot of mm -hmm. research. I had never been to Birmingham, I'd never been any further south than Chicago. Mm -hmm. I hadn't done much <laughs> traveling. Right. So uh, what I had to do was, uh, research for this was not as much as Bud Not Buddy, which was a different mm -hmm. era, and uh, language was a lot different mm -hmm. back then. So what I had to do with this one was to uh, find out more about the bombing of the church, mm -hmm. uh, about the girls uh, that were involved in it, what, what the atmosphere was in Birmingham at the time. Uh, magazines, mm -hmm. news stories, uh, reading books on the subject was pretty much all I had to do. Okay. Let's go to another email. This is from Mohammed at Key Middle School. <coughs> Dear Mr. Curtis, I was just wondering, will there ever be a part two to the Watsons go to Birmingham, 1963. How about a movie or a series? Sincerely, Muhammad. Muhammad, I really don't think there'll be a part to the to the Watsons. Um, I th I think for another uh, a sequel to be written to the story, the Watsons would have to go through something else. I think they've been through enough for for one family for one lifetime. Uh, unless I get real desperate for a story idea, then maybe you'll see a part two. So Muhammad, if you see part two of the Watsons, you can say. That author is desperate, <laughs> but otherwise I don't think I will. Okay. Let's go to another email. Oh, wait a minute, we actually we have a call. This is from William, I believe. William, what is your question today? Hi, Mr. Curtis. Hello, your William. Your books are both sad and funny at the same time. How do you do that? Both sad and funny at the <laughs> same time. Well, I think life is sad and funny at the same time, William. Uh, there are, one of the ways to get through tragic events is through humor. And a lot of times the, that they don't seem to go together, but that's kind of a human response, I think, is to, to laugh at things that aren't really funny. And any kind of joke that you can think of, William, think about it, really think about what's going on, and there's something that's not very funny really going on, and that makes the story funny. I think that's a defense mechanism, that uh, when we are faced with something that's sad, you, you don't want to stay sad, you don't want to be depressed, and a lot of times you use humor to pull yourself out of it. Thanks for calling, William. It mirrors real life. We have funny moments and we have sad moments. Right, and, we have and to you live can't through. draw a line between right. them. A lot of times they blend in together and mm -hmm. you can be sad about things. Like you can lose somebody that's very close mm -hmm. to you and you're very sad about it, but then you can have moments where you think about something funny that happened with exactly. that person. And, and sometimes that takes time. It does. It <laughs> takes time. Yeah. This is a question from Ivan. Dear Mr. Curtis, in your head, what happens to Kenny Watson when he gets over the state of shock at the end of the book? Sincerely, Ivan. Ivan. Um, I, uh, what happens to Kenny Watson, I think that Kenny learns a lot from Byron's reaction. I think Byron has matured a lot. I don't think Byron becomes this wonderful, sweet guy. I think he has a better understanding of life and the importance of his family to him. And I think that kind of reflects on Kenny. Um, I think Kenny does very well in life. Kenny's a very bright little boy. He's inquisitive. Uh, I think he does okay. I think Kenny makes out okay. But what I think is not important, what you think is important, and that's the fun thing about reading. Uh, some of the time people have said to me, you know, you left us hanging. What happens at, after this? That's, that's your job. You have to fill in the blanks. And that's what makes reading better than a movie, because mm -hmm. in the movie, someone else tells you what happens. In reading, you get to supply a lot of the endings, and it's, it's just as legitimate as if I were to do it. 
That's a great question. Thank you, Ivan. And, and the movies also tell you what people look like and what the scenery is. Right, exactly. Is and, and you, you, you have no input in it right. at all. You, you become lazy, really, mm -hmm. with a movie. Do you ever feel like an entertainer when you're writing your books or when you're doing your school visits with students? Probably more so when I'm doing the school mm -hmm. visits because uh, writing is, I'm entertaining myself when I write. Mm -hmm. When I, I write, I sit down, um, I'm in the library, I laugh, I have a wonderful time, but it's a pretty, pretty much a solo thing. When I go out to schools, um, I have a great time, I tease the kids, I, you know, I harass kids, it's, it's almost criminal what I do. <laughs> All right, Tevin, turn around. How did you know where Trinidad was, Tevin? I learned that in Spanish. You what? I learned that in Spanish. Okay, so, uh, wait a minute. Could you excuse us for a minute, please? <laughs> Tevin, what we're trying to do is encourage reading here, so, you know, if I ask you a question, say I read about it in Spanish, okay? <laughs> you do that for me? All right. So, Tevin, how did you know where Trinidad was? I read about it in Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> so, you must do a lot of reading, Tevin. Mm hmm Excuse us. <laughs> oh, yes, Mr. Curtis, and I love to read. You must do a lot of reading, Tevin. Oh, yes, Mr. Curtis, and I love to read. <laughs> Very good. So, Tevin, some of the time when you read, you lose your place? <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's frustrating, isn't it? Mm, yes. Yes, it is. So, Tevin, you know, when I go to a school and there's a student who's brave enough to stand up here on stage and has the right answer and he gets frustrated by losing his place a lot, I always bring a bookmark for that student. Since you, since you If a $20 enough, bill is one way to motivate kids to read, Christopher Paul Curtis is willing to make the investment. I'm from a city right there called Flint, Michigan. And when I graduated from high school, I thought, that was a very like he was a boring, boring writer. But when he came, it was appreciated. Then run back and do the whole thing on the second car. We do every. The road to becoming an author began in a car factory. During his 30-minute breaks, Curtis would write. When I was writing, I forgot about what I, the things that were bothering me. But I was also practicing. And writing's like anything else that you do. The more you do it, the better you get at it. For Curtis, writing took many forms. I know you're going to need help with your love letters, so if you want to take notes, I don't mind. I'd write things like, Dear KB Baby. It's nice knowing his personal stories, like a whole new point of view. You have to turn around and smile. Yeah. And you, since you're such a nice guy. This author's visit to George Washington Middle School in Alexandria, Virginia, brought an entire community together. Thanks to the support of teachers, parents, and local business partners. I like this book. But donated books and student preparation was key. In class, we read every, like every, not every book, but like most of the books every day. Worse segregations in northern cities. Detroit. Teachers created ways to discuss the Great Depression, segregation, and ideas conveyed by this acclaimed storyteller. The author also shared writing tips. He told me that you, once you really learn the mechanics and stuff of writing, then you can just throw them out the window and develop your own style. And by that I mean once you learn... Don't go away. Mechanics. Meet the author will return in a moment. Oh yeah, the one thing he taught us to do is... Read! When writing short stories, keep these ideas in mind. Always brainstorm so you know what your story is about Make sure your story has great details and characters and make the reader feel like they're really there. These tips will help you stay on the right track. Welcome back. I'm Della Kidd and with me in the studio is children's author Christopher Paul Curtis. Christopher, what was the inspiration for Bud in the book Bud Not Buddy? Originally I was writing a story about the factory that I worked mm -hmm. in during the 1930s, uh, the labor movement really got started there. Workers took over the factory and uh, wouldn't come out. General Motors brought tanks in. Mm -hmm. The National Guard mm -hmm. brought tanks in. General Motors wanted to make an example. They finally recognized the union. I wanted to write a story about that. And in the meantime, I'd gone to a family reunion in Grand Rapids, and people started talking about my grandfather, who during the 1930s actually did have a big band called Herman Curtis and the Dusky Devastators of the Depression. And I just thought that was the greatest name in the world. It is terrific. And I wanted to write something right. about it. And when I write, I'll have two things going on at the same time. 
um, because if you're writing about one mm -hmm. character and you just get fed up with them, you don't mm -hmm. want to be around them anymore, you don't want to hear from them anymore, mm -hmm. then instead of stopping writing, I'll jump over to this new thing. And I found uh, spending more and more time with the uh, concept of my grandfather. Uh, and I thought originally, as the story in Bud Not Buddy, that my grandfather would be the little boy Bud. But as the story mm -hmm. developed, uh, my grandfather remained this older man, this musician, and Bud was just a little boy who, I don't know where he came from, he just out of my imagination. Now in this particular book, were there composite characters as well? We were talking about those earlier. Uh, this one was more imagination. Mm -hmm. they, the characters, uh, some of the band members were based loosely on fellas that I worked with or that I grew up with. And in the uh, Hermione Calloway was loosely based on my grandfather. But this one was more imagination than composite characters. And what about the events? Were any based on your own life? None were based on mm -hmm. my own life, but some of them were based on, a lot of them were based on uh, actual historical events. Mm -hmm. There was the Hoovervilles, uh, mm -hmm. the concept of bread lines, mm -hmm. and uh, Bud was not really much of a unique child in that there were hundreds of thousands of children throughout the United States who were out on the, on the road. They were trying to find somewhere to eat, right. somewhere to live. They realized they were a burden on their families and that they couldn't um, be supported, so they actually left and uh, were just out on the road, much like Bud had done. Well, Bud created his own rules. Right. So when, as Bud's creator, uh, how did the rules evolve and did you have a favorite? Um, the rules actually, when, when you write like I mm -hmm. do, when you're, you don't know who the character is, authors, all authors do things differently. Some authors will outline everything, they know mm -hmm. their characters. I don't, I just start with this voice in my head and work on it. And you have troubles with consistency. So when I would write something about Bud, when Bud would tell me something, I would write down, okay, Bud feels like this, mm -hmm. and, then I, and then I'd have a little list mm -hmm. of things, Bud feels like that. And then I looked at the list and I thought, you know, this would be something that Bud would actually use to guide his own life. And so I incorporated it right into the story. And I think my favorite one, I don't know the exact number, and if you notice, Bud didn't know the numbers, the numbers would change from rule to rule, mm -hmm. but was something like, um, if an, ad an adult tells you not to worry, you better hurry up because you're running late. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, there's a, a suitcase that's integral to the story. Is it, is it a metaphor for something? Tell us the importance, the significance of the suitcase. Yeah, the suitcase, Bud is, has nothing really in mm -hmm. the world. He is an orphan, his mother's mm -hmm. gone, his father's gone, he's out of the foster homes. He's really set adrift mm -hmm. and the suitcase with the rocks and with the memories of his mother. It's kind of like his anchor. It's the, the thing that holds Bud together. It's uh, his whole life. Without it, he would be lost. And I think those rules helped guide him. And he had a lot of things that helped guide him. Luther T. Farrell was very much the philosopher. Right. So there were some similarities there between those two right. characters there, there as well. Right, there were similarities between mm -hmm. the two in that they both, uh, Bud had to create out of whole cloth mm -hmm these rules and things because we want rules. Sure. Kids want some kind of structure. We need guidance. Right, yeah. Bud wanted the structure. Uh, Luther T. Farrell, on the other hand, had the structure, but he realized there's something wrong with the mm -hmm. structure that I'm being brought up in. Mm -hmm. And he uh, used philosophy as something to try to, as a search mm -hmm. for the truth. And he also used science because science is hard and fast. Mm -hmm whereas the things that the Sarge was teaching him, she was teaching him everything's gray, you know. Right. There are rules, but you don't have to follow them exactly. You can skirt around them and, mm -hmm. you know, there's always wiggle room. And with science, there isn't. If something is what it's supposed to be, it's there. And right. if it's not, it's not. Let's go to the phone lines. Great. Okay, we have a call. What is your question today? Please make sure you tell us your name. Hi, Mr. Curtis, my name is Justin. Okay. Hi, Justin. Why do you think there should be more books about black kids? And what kind of music do you like? And what instruments do you play? I'll answer you backwards, Justin. Uh, I don't really play any instrument. I have two saxophones that both beat me. I never really learned them. My son has the tenor sax and my daughter has the alto sax. Uh, as far as your question as to um, why are there not more books about black children, I don't know. I really don't know, Justin. I think that that is, uh, that there is a real gap that there should be more stories about all kinds of black kids. Seems like the stories that we do here are all fall into usual categories. 
Um, that's why I think as a writer, my job, one of my jobs, is to encourage people like you, Justin, to write down your stories, to the things that happened to you. Might not seem interesting to you now, but you never know. Believe me, nobody in the world looks at things the way that Justin does. Nobody has gone through life that Justin has gone through. Uh, even if you have a twin brother or a twin sister, they haven't been through the same life and they don't look at things the same way you do. Uh, I think that there should be an increased encouragement in having African American children tell their stories, not just the African American children's children, uh, Hispanic children, Asian children, everybody. Uh, I think that there should be stories from all across the rainbow. Uh, we've just got to do more writing. You need to get out there and do some writing, Justin. We have an email and it reads, Dear Mr. Curtis, what are you writing now? What's it about? Sincerely, Shaniqua. Shaniqua, I'm working, like I said, I work on two or three things at the same time. Uh, a, a book that I have written will be out this October. It's called Mr. Chickie's Funny Money and I'm writing part two of Mr. Chickie's Funny Money right now. And it's in an area that I'm, I'm not really sure where the story's going, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. I'm also working on a story called Elijah of Buxton. And I live in Windsor, Ontario, which is in Canada, and it's right across the river from Detroit. And about 40 miles from Windsor in Canada is a city called Buxton. And during the 1850s, it was uh, the ending of the Underground Railroad. Um, there were many, many escaped slaves that lived there, up to 2,000 at one time. And I'm writing this story about a little boy there and his life. He was the first, he's got three things in his life that kind of make him different. The first thing is that he was the first child that was born free in Buxton, so he's really kind of celebrated for that. The second thing is that when he was a little boy, Frederick Douglass came to visit. Uh, he was a baby, and in celebration of him being the first child born free, Frederick Douglass held him over his head, and Luther threw up on Frederick <laughs> Douglass. So this is, he's well known for that. And the third thing it, that he's well known for is he can throw a rock better than anybody in the history of humankind. So those are the th things that I'm working on right now. Well. That was a good question as well. We have another call. Go ahead, ask your question, please, and remember to tell us your name. Hi, Mr. Curtis. Hi. Um, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm from Manassas. Um, I want to be a writer, so what should I do? Uh, Elizabeth, you want to be a writer? I think that's a wonderful profession. Uh, it's like I told Justin, we need a lot of different voices out there. And I have three very hard and fast rules that you as a writer should follow. Rule number one is to write every day. Writing is like anything else that you do. The more you do it, the better you get at it. So do it every day. It's like when you learn to dribble a basketball. When you first try to bounce it, it doesn't do everything that you want it to do. But with time and with practice, you get better and better. Same way with writing. At first, the story isn't going to go the way you want. The words aren't going to do the things that you want. But with time, it gets better. Rule number two is have fun with your writing. When you write, you're very powerful. You're, you're like a god, really. You can create worlds and you can destroy worlds. Have fun with that idea. Rule number three, avoid all rules. Ignore everything, all the rules. And by that, I mean you have to learn how to be a good writer first. You have to learn the basics. Once you learn the basics, develop your own style. That's what makes writing interesting, and that's what makes us would make us want to hear from you and the kind of things you say, because you would say them in a way that nobody else would. Terrific advice. Thanks for calling, Elizabeth. What is your, I have two questions for you. What does your editor do? And do you have to revise your work even when you think it's perfect? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. What does my editor do? Um, editors, I think, in a lot of ways are like English teachers mm -hmm. for older people, for writers. Uh, at my editor is someone who has more experience mm -hmm. with reading than I do with writing than I do, she can look at something and uh, have an idea of how it should go or what's not sounding right in a particular piece, and she can tell me what she thinks should be done. Now, as the writer, I have the final say. I can say, no, I want to keep it the way it is. Mm -hmm. But just like as a student should, if they're smart, they would respect what their teacher says because the teacher has more experience. I listen mm -hmm. very carefully to what my editor says 
because I might not be seeing something that she does. A lot of times when you write something, you're too close to it. Mm -hmm. You can't really see exactly what's being said. It's hard said. to maintain being objective. Right, it's, it's right. very hard. And uh, so my editor is somebody who is there for me to do that. She can help me through uh, rough times. She's somebody who says, well, I don't know, you know, you're, I know what you're trying to say here, but it's coming across like this. Mm -hmm. So she's helpful like that. And as far as editing myself, constantly, mm -hmm. uh, thousands and thousands. Um, I'm not one who obsesses over a particular sentence, yeah. but I'll go over a chapter, I'll, I'll probably hundreds of times. I'll read over it and make little adjustments. I read somewhere, and I'm, I'm not sure who it is, the writer who said this, but it, it's a, a perfect summation of what my editorial process is. It's like working on something with smaller and smaller screwdrivers. You're adjusting more and more and you're getting it more and more fine-tuned until finally you're using a very tiny screwdriver. There's not much that needs to be done, but you need to turn it just that little bit more and to make it good. So uh, that's, uh, editing is 99% is of the work of a writer is editing. Do you share what you've written with other people besides your editor? Yeah, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, you, you find out who is a good person to mm -hmm. read you and to give you good advice. And my best reader is my son, Stephen. Mm -hmm. I give it to him, and he's a great reader. Uh, he's done lots of reading. He can say, uh, you know, much like my editor, mm -hmm. and things that she, he says to me, it doesn't come across like this. And then I'll give it to Wendy Lamb, my editor, and she'll say it doesn't come across. And if both of them are saying the same thing, I realize right. I've got a problem. So it's good to have other people. I'll give it to, uh, I've got a group of young people that I give mm -hmm. what I write to, to kind of proofread through mm -hmm. it and to say, you know, well, I don't think a young person would say it like this, or this doesn't seem like a young person would think like that. And it's all very important. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, what advice would you give to teachers and parents about writing and the writing process? I, I think Just briefly. I think <laughs> that the main thing that they have to do is mm -hmm. to not forget the fun aspect of writing. Mm -hmm. I think that if you can let a child know that they can write this story about something uh, and with, there are no rules. Let your imagination go wherever you want. I think if we can impress on them the, the fun, not stress the importance of learning to write, but stress the, the fun that you can have as a writer, and it helps them to, to develop something. And it's, it's similar to a sport, it's similar to basketball, but it's very different. Because if you focus on basketball, when you get to be an adult, very, very few people are going to be able to do anything with that. Mm -hmm. One in a million is going to be able to do that. But if you focus on writing and learning how to write and having fun with your writing, that's a tool that you can use throughout your life no matter what you go into. Well, Christopher Paul Curtis, thank you so much for visiting us again and for sharing all of your ideas about the writing process. Thank you, Della. It's my pleasure. Thank you. We look forward to your next book. And if you want to learn more about Christopher Paul Curtis, go to his website at www.randomhouse.com. If you want to learn more about this program, visit us at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Della Kidd. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming.